will continue telling us about non-invertible symmetries. Recording in progress. OK, uh, well back, everyone. So let's continue our journey uh, into the realm of uh, non-invertible symmetries, in particular in uh, two dimension, uh, conformal field theories. So here I summarize some of the things that uh, we talked about uh, in the previous lecture, and also some of the things that I'll br briefly explain now. Uh, in particular, uh, in the previous lecture, uh, we introduced this notions, a mathematical framework known as fusion category, which is a natural generalization of group, group symmetries, taking into account their anomalies uh, into some more general object, and which we used later to describe symmetries uh, in conformal field theory that are associated with non invertible topological defects. So the, as we said before, objects in this fusion category correspond to topological defect lines, and in particular, in the CFT, they are associated with this twisted defect Hilbert space, This is a Hilbert space. Okay. Uh, on the cylinder, uh, when you quantize, uh, this is the time, and you quantize on the circle, okay, which is punctured through by the defect line. Okay. And then there's a notion of direct sum in the fusion category, and that boils down to the fact that on the, on the CFT side, a Hilbert space associated with the direct sum of lines splits into the direct, direct sum of the Hilbert space associated with the uh, individual uh, constituent uh, lines. And then there's a tensor product uh, operation in the fusion category side, and that allows you to decompose a product of, uh, uh, of lines into, uh, uh, into a direct sum, and that boils down to this uh, uh, picturesque uh, fusion product on the CFD side, which is a special case of OPE between line operators uh, in one plus one dimensions. And then there's this, uh, this notion of a dual object, which Pablo pointed out last time and I forgot to introduce. And that on the CFD side corresponds to taking the CPD conjugate of a given line. Okay. So in any uh, observable involving this line defect, you, you are free to rep uh, replace this diagram with this particular orientation by L bar, but in the opposite orientation. Question? Here? For the CFT. CFT just means that it's a composite line. So meaning that if you compute a correlation function where you insert a direct sum of a line, that correlation function becomes a sum of the correlation functions in which uh, in each sum end you have the individual line inserted. Okay. And then uh, there's the notion of the morphism, okay, in the fusion category. Uh, and on the CFT side, they simply correspond to topological junctions. This individual junction vectors are denoted by V, and they live in some juncture vector space, and that uh, has a natural interpretation in terms of the Hilbert space over here. A de generalized defect Hilbert space, a gen simple generalization of the above, where you have more than one uh, lines puncturing through um, the circle on which you quantize the theory, okay? So you have L1 bar here, L2 bar here, and L3 here, okay? And this picture is related to the picture over here uh, just by doing radial quantization on this circle, okay? Doing radial quantization, you map this point-like operator to a state uh, on this circle punctured through by these defect lines and the, the requirement of, of this object being topological boils down to the condition that you want to require uh, the corresponding state in the subspace to have h and h bar equal to zero. Just like identity operator, so it can move it around, costing no energy. Question? In this radial quantization picture, you know, the choice of the morphism, uh, how does it reflect in the, on the cylinder? Because right, so it boils down to a particular vector uh, in this junction vector space. So the junction vector space is a subspace of the superspace, restricted to the uh, eigenvalues of L0, L0 bar equal to zero. In general, that could be a uh, uh, you know, dimension bigger than one uh, vector space. It should be, uh, is it in general, it's a vector space. So this V, if it exists, is a vector in that space. Okay, so you choose a basis. That's right, so if that space is empty, that tells you that this topological junction does not exist. Okay, okay? thanks. Yes. Uh, 
Okay. Uh. Sorry, are you allowing uh, also for uh, non-trivial junction on the trivial line? Uh, for example, if you, you, you infuse the trivial line with itself, yes. and this, uh, this can say, be... Sorry, when you say trivial line, you mean identity line? Or? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so are, are you allowing for, for non-trivial junction? Let's say lo, lo, uh, local operators. Ah, in very the good. So, so, uh, so here, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I will get to that, but uh, um, uh, to, just to answer your question quickly, so I think you are imagining a case when, for example, one of the three external legs is identity. Also, all the three. If all three are identity, then uh, the implicit assumption I'm making in the CFT is that there's a unique vacuum. Okay, and that will answer for you that there's a unique, uh, okay. there's just one dimensional uh, uh, junction vector space there and they are proportional to the identity operating in the bulk. Okay. okay, and then more generally, if you take one of these lines to be trivial, uh, from the argument I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give shortly, if L1 and L2 are simple, then uh, the corresponding junction vector is again coming from identity operator taken to the line. Okay, like identity operator in the bulk taken to the line. Okay, okay thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so um, so these are the basic defining, defining data, uh, and there's one more ingredient. Uh, these are this uh, F symbol, okay? I will not redraw that diagram again, but it essentially uh, uh, like a matrix that keeps track of the change of basis uh, of the change of basis in the junction vector space associated with uh, four external legs, L1, L2, L3, L4, okay? There are two different ways to represent this junction vector space by factorizing a four-fold junction into a pair of three-fold junctions. And that change of basis matrix is captured by this F symbol. And the F symbol is subject to this uh, pentagon relations and it, that physically uh, just correspond to a consistency on this change of basis uh, operation. Okay. All right. So let's use this, uh, uh, this um, kind of the general dictionary to deduce some simple consequences, okay? In particular, relating to the fusion rule, that uh, um, um, specific features of this fusion rule, okay? So, so far, we have not been assuming uh, any special property of this line. For example, this line can be decomposable, but it turns out that if this line are taken to be indecomposable or simple, uh, there's a nice property of, of, the, of the fusion coefficient we can be, which can be interpreted uh, from the point of view of its topological junctions. And this will come to that next. So let's first introduce the notion of simple uh, topological defect line, okay? A simple topological defect line is defined by having a one-dimensional junction vector space, okay, between, uh, between itself and it's conjugate. Okay. So it's easy to see that this condition uh, uh, implies that this this uh, this defect line is decomposable. Okay. Let's let's see what's the, uh, why that's the case. First of all, for any uh, for any TDL for any defect line L, okay, it's easy to see that the dimension of the junction vector space between itself and its dual has to be bigger or equal to one just because the junction will be something like this, okay? And you can insert, include identity here, but you can forget about it as well because it's identity. And you can always bring the identity operator in the bulk to the line, and this gives rise to a non-trivial junction vector associated with L and um, L bar, okay? So if I draw the uh, L bar, okay? And identity. So, if L is decomposable, equal to L1 plus L2, okay, this implies that the dimension of the junction vector space must be bigger than two. This is because this factorization, I mean, this kind of uh, distribu di distributive property associated with the Hubert space, will tr defect Hubert space will translate to a distributive property for the junction vector space. And there's at least two contributions coming from the fact that for each L1 and L2, uh, there's a non-trivial um, topological vertex with identity. 
Okay. So just from this, you conclude from this definition that simple TDL must be in decomposable as we have expected. Okay. Uh, it turns out, strictly speaking, being decomposable doesn't necessarily imply simple in this definition, uh, but this will actually lead to uh, a generalization of the fission category I'll talk, I'm talking about here. So I'm happy to talk to you afterwards about that, but let's, for, for the moment, uh, focus on the case where actually in decomposable also uh, implies this condition. Okay. Now, once we have introduced the notion of uh, simple TDL, we can talk about the fusion product of this simple objects. So writing the similar relation over here, over there. Now, in general, there's some coefficient that appears uh, in the decomposition of the tensor product of the two simple TDLs into all the simple TDLs that you have in your theory. Okay, that generate all the uh, non-inverbal symmetries. I claim this coefficient is equivalent, it's equal to the junction vector space, uh, dimension of the junction vector space. So we write explicitly, associated with these three lines, i, j, k, okay? Defined over here. Okay, so how do we prove this? So let's focus on the simple case when Li and Lj are taken to be L and it's conjugate. Okay, and L is a simple line. Okay. Okay, and uh, uh, we want to show that this is equal to one plus other non-identity simple lines, okay, up to some uh, degeneracy, want to show, okay? So how do we show this? Let's consider the torus quantum function. So imagine the square represents the torus uh, in the coordinates which have two pi periodicity, both in the, this direction and in this direction. Think about this as time, this as space. Okay, so the opposite side is identified. And we insert this topological defect lines uh, as follows. Okay, and because of the, uh, the definition of the dual coming from the conjugation, I can replace this also by uh, the original uh, outline, but we invert its orientation. Okay, the torus has a modulus tau, as usual, to control the shape of the torus. Now, there's two different ways to compute this, uh, uh, this observable, the torus spanning function in the presence of these two lines. The first way is uh, to take directly the limit where tau goes to i infinity, okay? which means the time cycle becomes infinitely long. In that case, the torus spanning function uh, projects, well, essentially everything uh, pro uh, propagating this, in this time direction gets suppressed, and the only dominant contribution will coming from the vacuum, okay? States of dimension zero, uh, h equal to h bar zero states dominate, okay? Quantizing down this circle. And this picks out precisely the contribution from the junction vector space multiplied by this divergent factor that depends on the central charge. And Q is equal to e to the two pi tau as usual, okay? It's a different way to represent the modulus of the torus, okay? So we see this quantity shows up, which is what we want to relate to the fission coefficient here and here in the special case. Sorry? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, 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 you're right, right. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, thank you, thanks for pointing that out, yeah. Tau is going to I infinity, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. We can proceed in a different way, okay? Because we are on a torus, uh, and we have this parallel uh, uh, defect lines, we can apply the fusion of, their, of these lines, okay? The fusion that's over here. And we use uh, this uh, postulated expression. In general, you have multiple terms. But suppose this term is n, okay, n times one with some coefficient. You have n times the contribution on the same torus bending function, but with no line inserted, a corresponding identity line, okay? And then you have contributions coming from all the rest that in, of this, uh, sum, uh, this uh, right-hand side, uh, which all involve non-trivial uh, defect lines uh, inserted in this uh, time direction. Now, you take the limit that tau goes to infinity again, just like before. This, this parting function um, dominates over this one. Why? Because we have the tadpole condition that tells you only identity operator can end uh, non-trivially, uh, can end on the dimension zero operator. Okay? So this is computing the, the thermal parting function in the Hubert space punctured by a single TDL. Okay? There's a non-trivial ground state energy that is above minus uh, C over 24. And it's only in this case, the ground state energy is saturated, saturated at minus C over 24. So if you take the toggle to infinity limit, this, this guy dominates, and you get precisely uh, this expression. Okay? And equate these two, uh, you conclude that n is equal to 1. Now, just to generalize, uh, we can already use this result, okay? So what we want to show is over here, okay? And we can pick out, we can write this equation in a form similar to this by, uh, by fusing both the left-hand side and the right-hand side with orientation reversal of K, uh, of LK. So we consider the fusion of three objects in a similar configuration, okay? And this will contain a piece like this, okay, precise this coefficient, plus subleading, um, sorry, plus, uh, so this is the times the identity line plus non trivial lines. Okay? And once again, you can go through the same argument. So go to the torus. And now you have three uh, topological defect lines inserted along the time cycle. And in the limit where toggles on infinity, playing the same game, you find the dimension of the junction vector space goes up, multiplying the divergences, uh, the exponential divergences due to the Casimir energy. Okay, and doing the same comparison, this tells you that indeed, this fusion coefficient is the dimension, the complex dimension of the junction vector space. So from time to time, just to say some writing, I will drop the, uh, the L uh, when I label the defect lines, uh, just to, to, to save some time, okay? So this is a very simple formula, okay? But the, uh, the implication is actually quite deep, okay? Depending on how you think about it, think about it but there's a, there's a perspective uh, that was uh, kind of emphasized in the recent paper from Troy Cordova, uh, Singh, Lan, and Xiao. I think it just appeared some weeks ago, okay? They give, the, give a very nice interpretation for this formula and this generalization to higher dimension, which I want to, um, uh, want to say a few things about here, okay? So you can think about this as the Panin function
more precisely, the planning function S1, okay, of a topological quantum mechanics. Okay? In other words, it's just one dimensional TQFT. So one dimensional TQFT is nothing but a bunch of ground states with energy zero, okay? And the fusion coefficient is the Panin function of this topological quantum mechanics over the manifold, which is precisely the manifold on which you wrap the line when deriving the fusion rule. Okay? This generalizes, so this is in D equal to two, for D higher than two, Okay. If you again consider this kind of non-invertible symmetries, say of cold dimension one, this fusion coefficient will be replaced by a punning function by punning function of a d minus one dimensional UKFT. Okay, and uh, as you can imagine, GQFTs in higher dimensions are much more interesting than in one dimension, and that will lead to inter interesting structures for, or different properties for this kind of uh, fusion product. In particular, uh, the planning function, this planning function is no longer uh, required to be um, integral, okay, on general three-dimensional manifold, okay? So that will lead to kind of various exotic, but now understood properties of the fusion rule in higher dimension. Yes? Is this like a proven statement or is uh, based this? on, uh, yeah? Uh, this is, uh, I think as far as, uh, uh, it's not a proven statement. It's a, it's a statement, uh, it's a kind of a conjecture and it holds for all the examples that we know at the moment. Okay. And uh, it will be good to understand uh, uh, to what kind of generality this is the, this is the statement. Yeah. Because in higher dimensions, I wouldn't even know to define a, a simple object very well. So, uh -huh, uh -huh. you know, a lot of things. Uh, that's right, that's right, that's right, yes. So the, the, this nice junction vector space I'm talking about, in higher dimension, the junctions, I mean, if you talk about generic junction, it will be point-like, you can do, but if there is a non-generic configuration of this, uh, of this uh, uh, defects, the junction is typically also not uh, zero dimension. So uh, the junction vector space will involve some topological lines and so on, so it's more complicated, yeah. It's a very nice idea. Though. Yes, it's a very nice idea. Uh, and I think I agree with you that it should be kind of uh, more developed, should be developed further. Right? Sorry, can I ask, um, sure. is there some intuition why this uh, TGFT lives in one dimension? I mean, I naively would expect that uh, the TGFT lives on the junction, so zero dimensional. Uh, the TGFT, the TGFT lives on the, so because on, the, on this uh, fusion picture, the two manifolds are wrapping uh, one man. Sorry, the, sorry. The two defect lines are wrapping the wrapping homologous manifolds. Okay, okay. and you, you can take it to be I mean essentially identified as far as topology concerned, and the TQFT lives on that one-dimensional manifold. Okay. It is true that when you look at the junction, uh, then the TQFT, uh, you know, only operators in the TQFT shows up in the junction because there are there's no way for it to propagate anymore. Uh, yeah, because this is related to a question I did yesterday. That in higher yeah. dimension, I would expect that uh, if you look at the picture with the junk with the junction, uh, yes. the the three defects uh, yeah. can in principle live on different manifolds. Uh. That's right. That's right. So, so for example, where can does be a the TQFT lives? Yeah. Yes, you mean it can come out, for example. Yes. Right. And so, where does the TQFT lives so on which of the three manifolds? Yeah. So the TQFT here. Uh, so this is a very restricted statement. It's a statement about doing this particular fusion on parallel manifolds that are uh, homologous, okay? And the TQFT lives on that manifold, okay? Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so I agree with you, agree with, agree with you that there should be generalization of this statement. We have more com complicated configuration of these topological defect lines, but it's still to be developed, okay? That's a very interesting question. Uh, but that's beyond <laughs> what I'm uh, talking about here. Uh, let me just point out the similarity to this. Uh, I, I think some of you are familiar about similar kind of fusion uh, product that appears in supersymmetric uh, gauge theories. For example, study Wilson lines in 40 root 2 theories, and you encounter similar uh, fusion rule for the BPS lines, okay? In that case, there, there are also a similar interpretation of these coefficients, okay? In that case, you are talking about the fusion product of supersymmetric lines. As I mentioned, generically, if you're just taking the fusion product of 
line operators, the, the fusion product singular is not well defined, but for supersymmetric lines, there's a way to regularize the divergence in super, uh, supersymmetrically, and that gives a well-defined fusion product. And in that case, the coefficient also has a very nice interpretation. It has the interpretation as the super, uh, supersymmetric index of the quantum mechanics, okay? It's not a topological quantum mechanics anymore, but the planar function is replaced by the supersymmetric index, okay? So this is just a comment for people who study uh, these line operators, okay? This nijk corresponds to SUSY index of certain quantum mechanics, okay? So a uh, useful reference is the paper from Gauto, Moore, and Esky. All right. Okay. So uh, the, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, it's a symmetry action. of these topological defect lines on potentially uh, twisted, or other, in other words, defect Hilbert space, okay? Because this is the one place we, that, that really distinguish uh, the non-invertible symmetries from invertible symmetries, okay? Um, so what is the, uh, the, the kind of action we are looking for? So as I already said before, the defect Hilbert space comes from quantizing on the cylinder, okay? Where, uh, quantizing on the, on the spatial cycle of the cylinder that's punctured through by a defect line. Let me call it L1, okay? And say there's some state inside this Hilbert space, which I've been calling the defect Hilbert space uh, labeled by L1. I want to define, without the defect line, or as I already said before, the action of the topological defects on the Hilbert space on S1, uh, they correspond to encircling the, uh, the corresponding operator on the plane, right? So as before, we have this picture. This enclosing picture, after you shrink the defect line, because it's topological, you can shrink it, and the operator, local operator you produce after shrinking uh, encodes how this defect, uh, defect act on local operators. If these operators are in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, with the states. So this is, this is equivalent to some operation on the state. in the Hilbert space uh, with no twist, okay? Now we want to generalize this notion to the case in the presence of a twist, okay, in the spatial direction by this non-invertible symmetry. So the, the kind of intuitive picture you want to draw is something like uh, you want to include another topological line, okay, so L2, uh, in the, along the spatial direction, okay, wrapping this uh, cycle. Okay, but for this to define a symmetry, as we know symmetry is equivalent to topological property of this uh, various configurations uh, in these lectures, you want to make sure that this junction formed by these lines to be topological. Okay, but we already know what these uh, junctions are, okay. So uh, first of all, let me uh, write down the rep representation of the same operation on the plane using the usual mapping between the cylinder and the plane, and that correspond to this kind of diagrams. So this is the operator corresponding to this operator in the defect Hilbert space, and I'm drawing the same uh, diagram, but just uh, mapped to the plane, okay? So to sp specify the symmetry action, we need to specify the choice of junction. As we said before, a convenient way to specify a junction involving multiple uh, external legs, more than, more than three, is to th resolve this junction uh, into threefold junctions, okay? For which we treat as bu basic building blocks for higher fold junctions. 
So there are two different ways to resolve uh, as kind of uh, uh, as, as the same case as for how the F moves arise, okay? And they give rise to these two different configurations. Okay? And in general here could be some intermediate uh, topological line that appears uh, in the fusion product of L1, L2. And similarly, another diagram you can draw, which corresponds to a different way to resolve this fourfold junction. Essentially, you're res resolving in two different ways, like this way and this way. And in general, this could be some other uh, topological defect line if the fusion product is not commutative. Okay. Well, L4 is inside, uh, is a, is a, uh, is a um, you know, a potential simple line uh, appear in the fusion product of L1, L2. Okay. If L1, L2 have a commutative fusion product, uh, this can be taken to be the same set, but in general, they could be different. And we call these diagrams uh, lasso diagrams. <laughs> Okay, just, just because how they look like. And these diagrams define different actions of topological defect lines on the twisted Hubert space, in this case, twisted by L1. Okay, there are different actions. They correspond to, in this picture, different choice of the junction vector. Okay? And even more generally, Uh, you can even have a diagram where the 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 internal line that uh, that is immediately attached to the local operator that defines the twisted sector can be different from the outgoing line to the end, okay? By considering more general junctions over here. So, for example, uh, 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 staying to the case when this internal line is still labeled by L1, okay? This outgoing line could be, say, some other line, L4, not different from this L4, okay? And what this diagram means is that after you shrink, okay, I do not need to draw the other arrow, I mean, the line goes to infinity, after you shrink the topological defect uh, network, okay, that's encircling this operator with these various junctions, what this gives you is an operator attached just to the L4 line, okay? Some other operator, let me call it, uh, uh, coming from all this transformation, uh, let me call it phi prime, okay? The location doesn't change, but it becomes, starting from an operator that's, twisted, that's attached to the topological defect line labeled by L, you end up with an operator attached to the topological defect line L4. And what this means is that this defines operation, a linear map, from the uh, defect Huber space twisted by L1, okay, which correspond to these operators, to the defect Huber space twisted by L4. Okay? And the point of non-invertibility is that these maps, each individual maps, are in general not invertible. Uh, let me call this map uh, F. Okay. And I should also say that in the invertible case, you will, no, you will not have these non-trivial maps if L4 is different from L1, okay? So in the non-invertible case, the first non-trivial thing is that uh, when you restrict the case when L1 and L4 are the same, this map is, in general, not invertible, okay? And furthermore, there exists non-trivial maps between, L, uh, between the Hilbert space twisted by L1 and L4, even when they are not the same, okay? So that's the two features that distinguish the action of symmetries on the twisted Hilbert space in the case of non-invertible symmetries versus that of the group-like symmetries. Yes? 
do, do you get any like consistency conditions on these maps because of the Pentagon, no? Yes, so, so yes, these maps are not independent, okay? These maps, maps are closely related. For example, these two are related in a way by the, uh, by the F move, okay? So, so what I'm trying to say here is that you can, if you just want to have a most general action, okay, of this kind of uh, a TDL encircling an operator attached to another TDL, the most general action is specified by the choice of junction vector over here. You can represent this junction vector purely in this basis by including all the L3s he over here and all the choice of the threefold junctions over here. You can also do the same thing over here, okay? And these two different bases are related by that move. Okay? No, I was meaning, okay, maybe if you take like two operators inside, no, because you can just draw the diagram of the pentagon then. Here you do the diagram of the F symbol, no? Uh, sorry, I'm, uh, maybe I'm not uh, completely sure what you're talking about. Here, the, 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 the F move just concerns No, I know, I know, I know, yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. No, I, I will, uh, maybe in the discussion, okay, sorry. Okay, sure, sorry. sure, yeah. Okay, and uh, I don't have time to go into that detail, but uh, the action of symmetry on the twisted sector is, in general, a very important uh, um, object, okay? For example, in the case of group-like symmetries, the anomaly associated with that symmetry is equally encoded, so it is encoded by the, by the, um, you know, by the non-trivial phase that appears in F move, okay? But it also equally encoded in, uh, in the symmetry action in this twisted Hilbert spaces, okay? In, the, in that case, L1 and L4 are the same, okay? And in particular, you, you, will, uh, you observe this phenomena that the symmetry, the group-like symmetry, acting in the twisted sector can develop projective representations, okay? Even though acting on the untwisted Hilbert space, uh, it's faithful, okay, the linear representation, okay? And there's some generalized notion for this non-invertible symmetry but uh, I will not get into that uh, general detail now. Okay? Instead, let's move to another physical uh, object. Yes. Uh, just to make sure I'm understanding, if yes. the symmetry um, was invertible, uh, yes. uh, this junction could still be non-trivial. I mean, L L1 could be different from L4, uh, and uh, uh, this means that uh, the symmetry is giving a, an automorphism of the set of lines in the case of invertible. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're picking L2 and so, it's acting on the... So, so, so if, uh, if, if, uh, if all the lines are invertible? Yes. Okay, then for this junction to be uh, topological, the L4 has to be same as L1, just from the junction, con I mean, the, as we said before, the topological junctions are only if this condition are satisfied. Okay. Okay. So, so if this is, uh, I mean, if these are all invertible, L3 has to be the product of L1, L2. And because this is already L2, this oh, has yes. to be L1. Yes, yes. Okay. Of course, I mean, you can choose, uh, you can choose to insert uh, something that's not topological over here. I mean, but then you can now do the procedure to shrink the diagram down to a local operator, like what I'm doing here. So you have some two-point function, and there's a non-trivial OPE, which you can still study, but it will not give rise to this nice linear map between local operator and local operator. In that case, the OPE coefficient, in particular, of this non-trivial local operators would enter into this map, okay? Okay, the next important Physical quantity uh, that you know encodes information about fusion category in the CFT is the notion of the VEV of a topological defect line, okay, which is also known as the quantum dimension uh, of L in the fusion category. Okay, and this is a very simple no uh, notion. Okay, so the VEV is defined as the expectation value of the topological defect line on the cylinder, okay? So you have a cylinder, okay? And you have this topological defect line inserted in this, uh, in this uh, orientation, okay? So that's the definition. There are a nice property of this topological defect line, okay? 
On infinite long cylinder, you can consider infinite long cylinder, and on which you insert, uh, you know, uh, a composite Li and Lj. So call this Li, and insert another Lj. The fact that you have this fusion rule, so for now I'm always taking the lines to be simple unless I uh, say otherwise, okay? Because on the infinite long cylinder, everything is projected down to the vacuum. The state that propagated in this direction is projected down to the vacuum. It means that the VEV will satisfy the same uh, polynomial equation. Okay? So you can think about this as uh, some kind of cluster decomposition on the cylinder for this uh, lines. Okay? Sorry? That's right, that's right, yes, yes. But here I'm just using the fact that down the cylinder, it projects to the, to the, to the vacuum, okay? So that all in the intermediate, and because they're topological, can make them as arbitrarily far apart as the lines, okay? All right, so this means that uh, the, the VEVs are highly constrained by this polynomial equation with this very particular property that the coefficients are positive integers. So these are gonna be very special algebraic numbers associated with these VEVs. Now, there are additional constraints on these VEVs coming from unitarity. Unitarity would imply, in particular, that these VEVs are actually bounded below by one. Okay, this is a slightly Oops, I did it again, sorry. Okay. Uh, slightly non trivial to see, so let me uh, go through that argument, okay? Uh, the argument, actually, uh, it's a very simple argument involving the uh, consideration of a torus, which, come back, which will come back, so that's, uh, it's worthwhile to, to go through it uh, in a little detail, okay? But let me first say explicitly, uh, let, let me first say the consequence of this, okay? So in the case when uh, Li, these lines have expectation equal to one, that's the case when it's invertible. Okay, because this condition, going back to this equation, implies immediately that only one fusion coefficient can be non-vanishing and has to be one. Okay, so there can be at most one term on the right-hand side of the fusion product, and so they, they are invertible. Okay, they generate some group-like symmetry as usual. And, if the VEV is bigger than one, it's non-invertible. So in other words, if you have some line defects, which is topological, a quick way to diagnose whether you have a non-invertible symmetry or not is just to compute this cylinder expectation value. And if you find it to be bigger than one, then you know right away that you have a non-invertible defect, okay? I emphasize this is the case uh, uh, in one plus one dimension. This statement does not hold in higher dimension precisely because uh, the coefficient will depend on this uh, non-trivial TKFT, okay? Which is uh, the funding function no longer an uh, integer in general. Yes, question? Yes, sorry, um, but yes. if you normalize differently the lines, uh, yes. you get different quantum dimensions. Good, so, so okay, we'll come to that. Well, the, the next time I should make that clear, okay? If it does not, uh, ask me again. Right. So, so how do we derive this statement? Okay. And this derivation should also address this question. So, uh, so we'll be using locality. Okay. In particular, locality of the quantum field theory, the, in particular this case of 2D CFT, define a torus with the insertion of a line. Okay. So the, the object we'll be, we'll be studying is this, uh, the torus bounding function okay. uh, with the defect line inserted. Let me call this uh, L. The locality of the Euclidean CFT, or quantum field theory in general, implies that we are free to compute this spanning function. So let me, this, let me label this spanning function. So, so we are free to compute this spanning function in different ways. We're free to quantize the theory in different ways. So we can quantize on this spatial slice, and this defines, naturally, this spanning function. Okay. 
okay, with upper L, just to denote this particular uh, choice of quantization, uh, which can be interpreted as a trace over the Hilbert space on this, uh, on this spatial cycle, which, which is not punctured by any defect line, so it's ordinary Hilbert space, weighted by the action of the line, denoted by L hat, okay? The same L hat that uh, appeared over there, and weighted by the usual uh, Hamiltonian evolution factor okay, in 2D CFT are determined by the L0 and L0 bar. Now, there's a different way to compute the same planning function. Okay? So instead of quantizing, treating this as direction of time, we can treat this direction of time. That's a consequence of locality, okay? that you can quantize the theory in a different way. And in this case, uh, so that's equivalent to S transform. Okay? So if I still think about this direction as time, I want to rotate my picture. And as a consequence of that rotation, the line now, uh, so I'm going to do this direction actually, which is the, is the convention for that transformation, it's a 90 degree rotation this way, okay? And this defines naturally uh, the planning function. Now, for the, uh, it's a planning function, it's a thermal planning function uh, that's represented, so let me write in terms of the inverse, or the, sorry, the as transformed values of the shape modulus of the torus, so this is T2 tau, okay? And this is interpreted, okay, now as the trace over the Hilbert space, the defect Hilbert space, because now the defect punctures through the, uh, it punctures through the, um, the, the circle on which you quantize the theory. But because there's no other uh, defect insertion, uh, this leads to this simple thermal planning function with no additional insertion. Okay, and Q tilde is the analog of Q when, uh, so Q is, as before, Q is e to the two pi i tau, and Q tilde is just e to the minus two pi i over tau, okay? Now, the, the fact of locality equates uh, these two sides. Are you assuming C equals C bar? Uh, very good, okay. So let me, let, me, uh, let me forget about the subtlety with the gravitational anomaly under the, uh, under the uh, modular transformation, and uh, for simplicity, focus on the case when C is equal to C bar, okay? Uh, and in that case, a, uh, the right-hand side has a property because of the trace over Hilbert space, okay? Hilbert space is some vector space, in particular some vector space. Uh, it, is, uh, it has this decomposition, okay? Into uh, characters, okay? And because we have a topological defect line that preserves the Rossor symmetry, this will decompose, to, decompose into characters as some charge C uh, of the following form. But for now, actually, we, would not, we will not need this uh, specific form. All we need is the fact that this is positive if we restrict to the case when uh, tau is equal to it and tau bar is equal to minus it, okay? Because these coefficients are positive integers, okay? And each of the terms are positive, okay? So, uh, I mean, okay, you don't really need this. You just stare at this with this assumption is already positive, okay? Because each, uh, each, uh, each weight is positive and you're summing over some degenerate, uh, sum, summing over all the states. And what this implies, and okay, the reason I write this is uh, to address the question, okay? This is not required for the derivation over here, but I write this to address the question is because if you rescale your, what do you mean by L here? It will be uh, in tension with this being, being a, you know, a quantized uh, integer. Okay. So you can take a direct sum of this uh, line. That is fine because it's gonna re re uh, retain its inter integrality, but you cannot apply by, uh, by arbitrary number. Okay, and that, what, that's what, in what sense, locality is crucial uh, you know, in specifying these lines. Without that, you can modify by arbitrary phase, for example. 
There are still some subtle kind of counter term you can introduce for the line, but that's not relevant uh, on the cylinder with a flat geometry, okay? So there are subtleties of additional phase factors that you can introduce for the line by introducing one dimensional counter term. Uh, if you're interested, you can ask me afterwards, but it will not show up in this context. Okay. All right. So what does this equality imply? This equality implies, so if we take, so specify to this case, and uh, take the limit that uh, t goes to infinity, okay, on both sides. Once again, on the left-hand side, because t is sent to infinity, q is going to zero, the term that dominates the left-hand side will be the contribution from the L hat acting on the vacuum. So here I should write L hat. So this means that the VEV of this uh, line, which is the expectation value of L hat on the cylinder, okay, is equal to the limit of something that's manifestly positive. Sorry, uh, sorry? Uh, which, which exponential before? Here? No, I've, I've moved, uh, I'm a, can, I will start from here, move it to the right hand side. Good, okay. Okay, so we are, we are halfway there, okay? We proved it is bigger or equal to zero. We didn't, didn't already, we, did, we have not shown that it's uh, bigger or equal to one, okay? Uh, for that, we use the first fact, okay, that if you, we take the uh, fusion product of the defect line L and its conjugate, taking them to be simple, we have on the right hand side one plus other non trivial lines. Okay? And from this property, we already know this is big or equal to one. Okay? And then we use the CPT invariance of a general quantum field theory that says that these VEVs are the same. And as a consequence, we have shown that the VEV of L is big or equal to one. Okay, so I went through this kind of argument in detail because this is how, uh, this is actually how various non-perturbative non constraints from this fusion category symmetry have been derived in two dimension and also in higher dimension. It's just a generalization of this game using the locality of the path integral, which, whichever direction you call time can lead to different uh, expressions and that can lead to constraints on what kind of phases can appear uh, under a symmetric RG flow. Okay, so now, I just want to introduce uh, the general data. So after this basic building block, let me just introduce the general data for, uh, for a CFT uh, enriched by uh, non-invertible symmetries. Okay, so whenever you have a symmetry, apart from trying to uh, study constraint from the symmetry on the original CFD observables, okay, and another thing one can study is the additional observables that are brought to life because of this additional symmetry. In particular, those uh, living the twisted uh, uh, Hubert space from inserting this vertical uh, duality, I mean, vertical non-invertible defects, okay? So CFT, we call that CFT without defects, okay, in two dimension. Uh, the basic data is captured by the Hubert space on S1, okay, which is related to the local operators by the radial, uh, by radial quantization. Okay. And together with the OP coefficients between these local operators. Okay, 
And, and this data are subject to bootstrap constraints. Which are again consequences of the locality of the Euclidean observables. For example, the four point crossing equation can be thought of as consistency in cutting and gluing the four point observable on a sphere with two punctures. You can cut along this cycle. And you all can also cut along the other cycle. Okay, they give you two different OPE channels, and the equivalence between decomposition in the two OPE channels coming from inserting complete set of states on the circles leads to the bootstrap constraint that constrain this data. Okay? And there's a similar relation for the torus one point function. Okay? And it's a non trivial fact that. Uh, a set of data that satisfy the two kind of consistent conditions, there are infinite set of consistent conditions because you need to consider arbitrary insertions labeled by states in, in here, okay? And similarly here for the one-point function. But the non-trivial fact is that once this set of con conditions are satisfied, this defines the consistent CFT, okay? So all the cutting and gluing consistent conditions on arbitrary gen uh, general Riemann surfaces are automatically satisfied once these two basic moves uh, fulfills. This generalizes with DDLs in a natural way. So in the moment you have topological defects in the CFT, as I said, there's this additional structures that appear, okay, just from the locality of the conformal field theory. You have this defect Hilbert space, okay? And you also have this additional uh, OP coefficient, sorry. So let me write it here. You also have this additional OPE coefficient that involve operators now in the defect Hilbert space. So they can generally be represented on the plane by some diagram like this. Okay? Where the external legs are some topological lines. And there's some topological junction leaving here. But the external operators correspond to operators in the corresponding twisted Hilbert space. So these are the additional data you bring to the game. And to fully specify a non-invertible symmetry in the CFT, after having some evidence for such objects, is to solve for these quantities, okay? And they are subject to similar bootstrap equations. For example, the four point function, once again, but now attached to a network of this uh, 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 topological defect lines. Okay? So all these lines are not just the mnemonic for OP exchange, but are extra uh, defect lines. And depends on whether you cut in this direction, okay? I don't want to draw the circle again, just to mess up the diagram or this direction, okay? inserting complete set of states, and last leads to constraint on this data. So this provides, there's a similar generalization for a torus one point function, which I'll not draw. This provides an axiomatic approach to identify non-invertible symmetries in 2D CFT, okay? So having non-invertible symmetry in 2D CFT, because we discussed, if we assume the existence of this uh, topological defects, it will imply all these structures that satisfy cutting and cooling as a consequence of locality. So if you are given, just abstractly, CFT data, like the local Hilbert space and this uh, OP coefficient, 
the thing you need to do abstractly to identify a non-invertible non symmetry in the CFT is to solve for this additional data. Okay? If you find a solution, then you are sure that you have this non-invertible symmetry. Okay? But as you can see, uh, this is going to be a formidable task for general CFT. Okay? Because there are many bootstrap. Ah. Yeah, so I should wrap up. <laughs> Right. Okay, uh, but, uh, but as we'll see, uh, there are additional physical uh, arguments that allow you to infer the existence of topological defects without solving this uh, equation explicitly. But these equations can be solved explicitly in rational conformal field theories. Okay, let me not get into the detail, but let me just say that uh, in the next lecture, we'll discuss uh, explicit examples that uh, realize the symmetries uh, and produce solutions to these equations without actually solving these equations explicitly. Um, okay, I think I'm going slower than I expected, but that's fine. So let me stop here and uh, uh, take questions. <laughs>